It's a very common sense approach. Steel sheet pile does not know how old it is. It only knows one thing. What condition is it in? It can be a year old and all torn up. It can be 20 years old and in really perfect condition. Welcome back, and today we are sitting down with Lee Wilsinski, who, whether he wants to admit it or not, he is a legend in the steel sheet pile industry. He's been in the construction industry for over 50 years, and 45 of those have been specifically in steel sheet pile sales. So if you know him, you know he's not afraid to challenge the status quo, which is why we're always interested in what he's got to talk about with us today, especially when it comes to steel and heavy equipment. And Lee, before we get into sheet pile, I want to point out a couple of more things. You not only hold the highest rank in Toastmasters International, but you've been a consultant for behavior profiling for the past 30 years. How did you get into that? Tell us about it. Well, at one time, a long time ago, I was impressed with consultants, and I thought that'd be a wonderful way to go. But I found out that most of the consultants just aren't true to their heart. They go in there to make money, but they can't change anything. In fact, it's very difficult to change behavior. And the more I learned about behavior, the more I learned that I wanted to help them hire the right people. If you hire a dud, they don't work out. You might as well fire them because they don't change. In fact, if they get fired enough times, they may realize that it's them that's the problem, not their employer. It's kind of it's that simple. Right. Makes sense. So you've been able to apply that to to your business, I'm sure, in, in hiring people or even in sales. D did that come in handy? Well, of course. In fact, it comes in handy for everybody because the golden rule is wrong. The golden rule says you treat others the way you want to be treated, uh, that they want to be treated. People want to be treated differently. You may be want uh, someone who's very direct and outspoken. I may want to talk to someone that's very analytical and kind of quiet and reserved. So if you understand behavior, you can communicate with people much better. Uh, for the younger guys out there who are new, what kind of advice would you give them in their sales journey? I know you started in this a long time ago, but is the same principles still in play when it comes to selling equipment and material, or is it totally different these days? It's always been based on relationships. I think people love to buy from people they like. Why should they buy and spend their money with someone they don't like? My advice to people is when you make a sales call, make yourself presentable, make yourself friendly, make yourself so that they want to see you come back again. They don't want someone flamboyant. They don't, they just want someone that, my gosh, this is a nice guy. And next time he comes by, I hope he stops. One of my rules was always don't spend too much time. As soon as he makes a little gesture like he's done, get out of there. Some people want to talk longer, some want to talk shorter. But always present yourself in a way that if you call on him again next week, He's going to be glad to see you. Very good point. Very good. Relationships. That is number one. In, in anything, in, in anything and everything, business, uh, regular life even. I think a lot of us miss those signs. Some days you're right. We don't get out of the way when we should. Uh, when did you first get interested in uh, steel sheet pile? Were you already selling heavy equipment at the time or was it, how did this work out? Actually, it was a quirk. I was working with a manufacturer of lasers that were used in construction alignment. And I set up dealers all across North America, Canada, even in Europe. I was getting sick of traveling. And by a quirk, I, they wanted me to come to work for them. This was a company that sold piling. And I really wasn't that interested. But one morning, I just happened to talk to their sales manager. And he presented to me, and I said, you know, I won't have to travel. But I have to move from the Midwest up in Illinois all the way down to New Orleans. But I was interested enough, I was tired of traveling all the time, five days a week, that I looked at it as an opportunity. So it just popped up. Now, I, before we get too technical, and like a lot of people listening, 
I'm not an expert in sheet pile. I don't know a lot about it. I have done some videos about it for ENC, but can you describe exactly what it is and what it's used for? Sheet pile is the ability to make a wall and drive the wall into the ground with integrity so that it's solid. So that on one side, if there's uh, sand and earth, it can't get through. And if on the other side there's water or something else, it can't get through. So it's an integral wall. It's held together with these steel interlocks. And it's as simple as that. Uh, steel sheet pile serves a purpose as permanent and it serves a purpose as temporary. A lot of people drive along and they wonder, how did they put that pier in that middle of that river? How'd they do that? Well, they built a steel box with steel sheet pile. They pumped the water out, they went in there, drove the piling and built that concrete structure to hold the bridge. So steel sheet pile plays an important part in temporary situations for construction and in permanent situations. Now, are there different types of sheet pile or is it just, is everything one type? No, there's many types. There's lightweight sheet pile, medium weight sheet pile, there's aluminum sheet pile, there's the regular steel sheet pile. The varieties are, years ago when I first got in the business, there were three or four types and only three or four manufacturers. Now there's, every manufacturer could have 30 different types, 20 different types. There's a lot of variety in shape and section and strength and interlock. It's a very diversified type of uh, steel in this day and age. So when you're talking about some of the temporary things, I guess that would make a market for used uh, steel sheet piling. And I know there's a lot of different factors that come into this, which would make one more appropriate than the other. But what's the most ideal situation of new versus used? How would you use those or what applications? Well, you'd have to use news if the owner wants new. So the engineers and the owner determine what they want to buy. If they want new, you have to supply new. If it's a private project, it's not a government project, many owners can see that used can be just as functional and they would buy used. Used is used more on private projects. Are there people that rent or lease sheet pile? Yes, there's uh, about temporarily? Six, six companies in the United States that just rent sheet pile. And they, wow. Because of, if you own sheet pile and you're a contractor and you've got a whole maybe 300 tons of a 30 foot long pile, what's going to inevitably happen is the next time you have a job, you're going to need 40 foot pile. <laughs> in some ways, it doesn't even make sense to own pile. It makes more sense to rent it. Rent what you mm -hmm. need and then send it back. So what are some of the things a buyer looks for when they're looking at the condition of used uh, used material? It's a very common sense approach. Steel sheet pile does not know how old it is. It only knows one thing. What condition is it in? It can be a year old and all torn up. It can be 20 years old and in really perfect condition. The common sense part of it is you look at it, if it's straight, if the interlocks are clean, it looks good, it probably is good. You can get a little bit more technical. You could cut a piece of pile off another pile. You could run it through the interlocks to check that the interlocks are adequate for uh, the pile to th thread together. But basically, it's a visual thing. Uh, it's been trimmed. Most pile has to be trimmed and reconditioned and cleaned. And if it's done correctly, a common sense person, a young girl in high school could look at it and say, yeah, that's straight. It's clean. I think it's drivable. So how about the storage and handling of steel sheet piling? Is there something that you have to do in storage to help it maintain its life if it's going to be laying around, or how does that work? Steel sheet pile, whether it's in a yard being stored or it's on a job, most of the expense is in the handling. You just can't find gorillas big enough to pick up a sheet of sheet pile and put it somewhere. You need equipment. You need equipment, you need an operator. Then if you have an operator, you need the space to put it. If you put it into your yard and forget about it and come back two years later, you can't find it because the weeds have grown up all around it. 
and you want to store it in such a way that it's loadable. You have dunnage under it, so a forklift can come in, pick it up, and put it on the truck. There's a lot of small little, again, common sense ways that you have to be aware of to handle sheet pile correctly. Now, I know in some of the videos I've done, they talk about hot roll versus cold formed. Uh, it's a controversial thing in some ways. W what is your opinion or your or the facts that you know of uh, on the comparison? Well, <laughs> I can get on my preacher stand and talk for an hour on the difference between cold formed and hot roll. I ran a branch for a company in New Orleans back in the, probably, well, I, I started in the 70s, but cold formed came out in the early 80s. And there was a lot of people that just, oh, this can't work because the interlock was different. But basically, well, that, that difference is there and it, it really is only there to make integrity in, in the sheets, to make an integral wall. Cold formed, in my opinion, is just as good or better than hot roll. The only difference is the interlock. The interlock on cold form piling appears different. When you see it in different uh, pictures, it, it looks a little Mickey Mouse. But in reality, it fits together and won't come apart. It, it does the job that it's supposed to do, and that's provide an integral wall, two pieces together, so you've got water can't come in, soil can't come in. Uh, the big difference is the interlock. Very rarely, uh, people say, well, the hot roll has a tighter interlock. Okay, it's got a tighter interlock. If you need a more uh, water tightness, in this day and age, you can buy a, a, a solvent or a sealer, and you can run that through the interlock with a little caulking gun, a little electric caulking gun. And the cost is very low, maybe a dollar a foot, something even cheaper than that. So there's no excuse to say, well, hot roll is tighter, and I've got to have hot roll. Well, uh, if that's true, buy a sealant. It's still probably cheaper. Interesting, interesting. Steel is steel. Excuse me. Steel no, is you're steel. Fine. You have to roll it to a certain grade. So it's just like your, your, your fork that you're eating with. One fork is the same as another fork. The only difference is maybe the design and the shape. And when that is true of all types of steel. What we are doing is we're selling something that... Uh, based on availability, price, and relationship. Now, over the last couple of decades, has the industry changed a lot? I, I know you're, ta you're talking about the coal rolled uh, coming out. Have there been a lot of other changes other than that? I think uh, the sections, there's many more sections. The hot rolled people don't have a monopoly on the market anymore. So to be competitive, they make deeper sections, wider sections, they have had a lot of competition from cold formed and the fact that cold formed was able to design a greater variety of sections. So that competition always spawns growth within the industry. So now all manufacturers have a variety. They have, instead of selling you one Timex watch, they've got a whole basket full of watches that they can sell you and find one that's better for your application based on the strength you need, the width you need, driving time, all the other factors. There's a variety of sheets. When I first got in the business, there were about every manufacturer had maybe six different types of sheet. Now one manufacturer can have 20 different types of sheets. Over the last few decades, what about the installation equipment? How has that changed? Is it, uh, well, I would assume it's there, gotten better? There's big, there's big changes. Some are better, some are worse. In the old days, when they drove pile, they normally drove it with an impact hammer. And if you didn't drive it properly, you had to extract it with a reverse impact hammer that was pounding up to get it back out. So you really were going to be very careful. And you did all kinds of things to make sure you installed it right. You might stick the whole wall for 100 feet. You wouldn't drive it down all at one time. You'd drive it down the stages. You'd have keyed sections that were a little bit deeper than the other sections because you couldn't really adjust for errors. You had to be right. And that was good construction practice. What's happened, in my opinion, is contractors have become a little sloppy because now 
the tool we use to install sheet pile is called a vibratory. And it doesn't impact the sheets. It vibrates them in the ground. And then it can, at the same time, you can put the line pull on the crane and vibrate them out of the ground. So where someone would be real careful 40 years ago, now they take the first one and they drive it straight and they start driving and maybe they get off a little bit. Well, they'll just drive them back up again and reset it and do a few things. I think uh, that modern practices have actually uh, interfered with the precision and the quality of, and I say quality, I mean the plumbness, the straightness, the accuracy of driving sheet pile. I don't think it's as good today as it was 40 years ago, only because the tools are so much easier to use and allow you a few mistakes and you can correct them. And let's kind of get into domestic and imported stuff. What's, what's the advantage or disadvantage of the domestic over the imported sheets? There is none. Price is the only uh, factor. Generally, so, imported are cheaper. Imported is still cheaper. So uh, do some projects specify you have to use USA material? All your United States Corps of Engineer projects, and there's millions of dollars of core projects every year. So the two hot rolled manufacturers of steel sheet pile in the United States have the advantage and the luxury of they have no competition outside of themselves. It's, do you find the lead time, is it longer when you're having to bring that from overseas or, or, or can the, are the domestic meals just as slow or how does that usually work? Well, years ago, a freighter would leave its location, let's say in England, and it didn't have a schedule. It might go to Brazil, and then it would go to uh, uh, Miami, and then it go somewhere else. They, they were like tramps, like tramp steamers. Nowadays, everything's on schedule. The ship leaves Luxembourg. It's in, uh, in New York four and a half days later, and then it's in Miami six days later. Everything's on a schedule. You have container shipments now where if the material is less than uh, 50 foot or 40 foot, you can put it in a container. Containers have streamlined the ability to uh, logistically move stuff from one place to another. So uh, you can really count on shipments in advance anymore because everything is so accurate as far as timing. There's no such thing as putting on a freighter and not knowing where that freighter is going to go. 50 years ago, you put it on a freighter, and, and unless you paid a premium, and you know all of us want to do things as economical as possible, that ship could end up going to Timbuktu before it got to you. Looking at, at contractors and project owners who are probably listening to us today, what suggestions would you give them to source their steel efficiently and not overspend? Oh, always come to me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's real simple. It's always good to get the plug in. That's what we're here for. I don't um, think I have to give them advice. Most contractors are experts in building. They're experts in buying. They don't need a lot of advice. Right. Makes sense. That's how they get there. If they're good and they're still, they're still around doing the right things. And as far as who they're buying from, most of the companies are pretty stable. And it's like that old axiom, you know, if it's too good to be true, it's probably not. And, right. and in the steel business, Prices aren't that different. They're all pretty mm -hmm. similar. It goes back to that knife and fork. They're the same material, the same shape. There's not a big difference. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes uh, dependability, relationships, past experiences play a, a, a part. Occasionally, a contractor will pay a little bit more, but that's only when the supplier he's dealing with is the only one that has it in stock. Other than that, very rarely are they going to pay, in fact, well, very rarely will they pay more than the market. There's no reason to. And it's not an executive position. When you buy pile driving equipment, the president of the company normally gets involved. You buy steel, he doesn't even know you're buying it. It's a commodity. <laughs> right. Price. Is right. it a dollar a pound? Is it 50 cents a pound? What else could I buy it for? Hey. And sometimes they'll even buy it from someone they don't like only because they have it available in the quantity they want and delivered at the time they need it. And, and I know uh, there have been a lot of material 
price increases across industries this year. Um, and I know in the steel industry, it's been a roller coaster. How does the future look right now uh, or what you're seeing or what you can take a guess in your crystal ball of, of how all, all that will play out maybe over the next year or so? I don't think prices are going to come down considerably. I think this is a time when prices, a lot of people out there that would buy on speculation for inventory, etc., have been hesitant now because they don't want to buy something that they own it and the price goes down. But basically, it's at a high, it's as high as it's ever been. But I don't see a drastic swing downward. Why should it get cheaper? Our current president is doing everything he can to make things more expensive. Right. No doubt. <laughs> I, no doubt. I just don't, my crystal ball says uh, prices have risen in steel and they're going to remain high for some time to come. I agree with you. I, and I don't know that this new infrastructure bill will, will be put to the right use and benefit steel. I don't know that it'll help. Well, um, let me interject and interrupt you. That's a big joke. In the 30s, when you built a bridge, you had 100 guys working on that bridge. And mm -hmm. then you paid them menial wages, and they did manual labor. Build a highway, same thing. Build a building, same thing. Nowadays, I can, I can, I'm not a contractor, but I could go out and build a bridge with six guys. <laughs> Maybe right. five. I just need one good crane operator and a couple guys that think well and plan ahead because I've got the equipment to build a bridge. So we're not right. creating. The Congress is so, uh, the last administration. They're so wrong. There's no correlation between more jobs and spending more money. We're going to spend more money, but we're not going to put more people to work. It just, it's a fact. People don't even think about that. Oh, we're doing this big bill for infrastructure. We're going to put people to work. Not going to happen. We're, we're, it, if you're in the business already, if you're a supplier or a bridge builder or a contractor, good for us. But to make more jobs, I kind of doubt it. Uh, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> it, it makes sense. Makes sense. Now, I'm going to save the best for last. I think this is uh, 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 the question that we all uh, love to answer. Uh, what about China? It's all about economics. I'm not a fan of China, but I'm a supplier. And if I make <laughs> a few bucks, I, I would sell Chinese products. But Trump had it right. Let's, let's not allow the Chinese to undercut our industry. Let them on a level playing field. They've got, I think so many of the times before, even with tariffs, the Chinese government was supporting the manufacturers by subsidizing the cost. Uh, China is an unfair competitor. China uh, is, a, is not capitalism. Capitalism is competition. Capitalism is the best man wins. Uh, in China, it's a manipulation of the market, manipulation of the patents, manipulation of everything. They're, it's successful so far, but there's got to be something wrong with it. It's going to collapse one day. We have enough trouble being democratic and being capitalistic to be successful. And I just can't see how they're going to continue success by controlling things from a central location. Capitalism is decentralized to many extents, although we've got a bunch of people out there right now, half of our population that thinks uh, the government should be bigger and subsidize more and take care of more. I am very conservative in that respect. I don't think China, when its standards keep rising, and if they were a legitimate uh, government, they'll compete but not to the extent they are now because they're not playing fair. They're, they have a different uh, version. They have a different playing field. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree 100%. I agree. Well, we, we want to thank you so much for your time today. Your knowledge and wisdom and all is greatly appreciated. And I know a lot of the listeners out there are going to be uh, happy to, to hear your, your input and advice. So thank you so much for joining us today. And um, Hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll, we will have a good few years ahead. I'm hoping so as well. But thank you so much for being with us, Mr. Lee. We appreciate it so much. I enjoyed it also. Thank you.